that based on Mr. Sharp's objection, I withdraw the question, but I'll just tell the court um, briefly. So um, Mr. Stevens was believed by Mr. Crittenton to have um, robbed him, stolen some of his jewelry. Um, as a result, Mr. it is believed that Mr. Porter um, alerted uh, Mr. Crittenton as to Mr. Stevens' whereabouts. And um, Mr. Stevens was Mr. Crittenton's intended target. Um, there has been testimony and will likely be a little bit more testimony about the um, impetus of the transition from one group to the other. Um, Detective Thorpe, um, because of his relationship with um, kids who were, I'll say, rock crew adjacent associates, he was able to, because of his relationship with them, they willingly offered him information that he was able to then go and get to assist to help him solve that crime. So that's that's as specific as that inquiry gets. And okay. And so, but yeah, given the hearsay and confrontation clause objections that have just been voiced, you yeah, I can. Um, what I'll do with the court's permission, if it's okay, if it's an okay question by the court standards, is just ask. Um, Well, given that that's what that that was what I was going to pull out, whatever the court's ruling is. Well, it seems like the only way he would know that is through his <coughs> investigation, and given that it was an investigation, that would be testimonial, and 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 they're not. T he's not talking about what they said. He's just saying that they were able to. And it's not that he's saying, I learned X, Y, Z. Well, how did you learn it? Well, somebody told me. Right. So it's still hearsay. So I think you rephrase it in a different way. Right. I can, I can withdraw. Okay. I can withdraw. All right. Your Honor, I appreciate the fact that the state's withdrawing this line of inquiry. However, I would just like to say moving forward, um, it, this is an example. This alleged crime, or I mean, it, it was adjudicated in court. Uh, from 2011, I believe, is not on the indictment. There was no 404B notice. There was no 418 notice. There was no discussion of this as an intrinsic act. So, you know, I just don't think that we should just be bringing up wholly unrelated murders just willy-nilly without at least noticing the other side of our plans to do so. That seems reasonable. You know, as it relates to... As it relates to the information that I elicit from the witnesses, it's nothing that hasn't been. Number one, I'm not, it's not 404B because I'm not saying that any one of the defendants committed this act. In fact, it was alleged that Trontavia Stevens was the intended target. So in as much as it, the questions that I ask may involve incidents that YSL members were involved in, Number one is going to be things that have been provided in discovery, but number two, just because it's another act or overt act, and I think that my brief to the court sort of addressed this, but it's relevant information and evidence of the existence and the nature of the enterprise that they claim is a rap group. So every time that we present evidence of something that proves the existence of the enterprise and the nature of the enterprise, there has been and will be the objection that it's 403, it shouldn't, it's too prejudicial. But the point is, is that, the point is, is that the um, information that I'm soliciting from the witnesses are intended to prove up elements of count one in this indictment. He's, he's talking about a lack of any kind of notice. Uh, but so he he wants he wants to know the the questions because I don't believe that a notice of my asking about questions regarding incidents that 
one we've talked about. I don't believe that we have the court that the defense is entitled to the, the list of questions that the state is going to ask. No, I, I agree with that. But we've this. never spoken about this. There's no mention in the <laughs> discovery, to my knowledge, certainly no police reports about the uh, murder of, I guess, Julian Jones. I only know that because Detective uh, Thorpe said that name. Uh, no mention of the Javaris Crinton case. There's no mention of that in the discovery to my recollection. So I don't know what, where the state's saying that they've given notice through discovery. But even if even if they had given notice through discovery, there's also Georgia rules of evidence that dictate when notice needs to be given when bringing up extrinsic, non-charged matters in a, in a trial. And that has not been done. And I just don't want, you know, at this point, I think that we've cut this off, this particular incident, but I just don't want it to repeat in the future. Your Honor, and that's another thing. These matters that um, are alleged by the defense as being extrinsic, uncharged matters, they're not. When we're asking about them, and just to um, cap off something Mr. Sharp said, we've had a witness already talk about um, the Creighton murder earlier on um, and Trontavious Stevens' involvement in it, just to put a point on that. But these, the assertion that these are extrinsic, uncharged matters are efforts, we believe, to curtail the state's um, uh, um, right to prove its case through valid questions that are not um, uh, improper. They are not impermissible. They're not 404B. These are um, questions and evidence through testimony, we believe, that proves an element of one or more elements of count one, the existence of the enterprise, the nature of the enterprise, um, and the means by which particular people participate in the enterprise. Well, I'm not sure that the evidence, I mean, it's not going to come in through this witness in this way anyway, but I'm not sure how evidence that Porter told Crittenden Stevens whereabouts no, so in any way establishes any of your elements that you need to prove for Rico. So, Your Honor, I, since we're not talking about this particular one, the point that I was making is that this detective's investigation involved um, members, a member of, two members of Rock Crew and information he was able to obtain through other persons associated broadly. I'm not arguing or trying to get that in. I'm saying that there will be times when we are asking about matters that I have heard alleged are extrinsic, but they are not. And I guess it's on, you know, if there's an objection, that's one thing, but the defense is in no way entitled to know every time we're going to ask about something that tends to prove what it is that we are alleging in the indictment. And so I, to the extent that that's what is being asserted, we, we vehemently um, disagree with that. We are not and will not go further into um, that particular inquiry with Detective Thor about that particular murder. But um, instances that involve actions and, and YSL members that witnesses have personal knowledge of um, are relevant to show the existence and nature of the enterprise and other material. I, I guess we'll just have to see as the evidence plays out. All right, let's get the witness and the jury back in.
Thanks for your patience. Go ahead, Miss Love. Was the investigation into the murder of Donovan Thomas the most uh, exposure or most extensive investigation you've done um, that in, throughout your investigation of Donovan Thomas, um, did you have an occasion to uh, investigate more about the group YSL? Uh, yes, ma'am. Was that the most extensive investigation that you have done that has involved or in which the name or group YSL has come up? Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. What is the... When you went out to Van Ira on January the 11th of 2015, um, was Deshaun Quarterman the only one you talked to? Um, my recall, yes. Did you speak with <coughs> Emmett Yarbrough as well? Yes. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Without talking about anything that Emmett Yarbrough um, said, um, Were there concerns addressed regarding the Donovan Thomas murder? I will call it, I believe so. When you collect shell casings as you, or did you direct I'm sorry, when you are on scene as lead detective, do you or other homicide detectives working sort of in tandem with you, do you all direct the collection of those shell casings? Yes, ma'am. And what do you do with them once you collect them? Yes, ma'am. Um, they're photographed and they're placard, so we know exactly what shell casing belonged to what group. And uh, at the time, our crime scene um, investigations unit they collect the shell casings, and we at that time, at that time, we turn them in directly to the GBI mm -hmm. firearms. Now, do you all also have a uh, with the Atlanta Police Department? Do you all also have a firearms section or a, a department that conducts Niven comparisons? Yes, ma'am. We do now. Is Jennings Kilgore the person that does that? Yes, ma'am. Did you work during the investigation into the murder of Donovan Thomas um, with ATF as well as the GBI? Yes, ma'am. Was some of the evidence that was collected in later um, associated incidents submitted to the ATF versus the GBI? I, I believe so they were, yes, ma'am. Did you collect the firearm or did you um, interact with the person that you saw going into the barber shop with the assault rifle? Yes. Did you collect that firearm? Yes, I did. At various points in your investigation, um, did you gain information that caused you to interact with a Quintez Griffin? Yes, ma'am. And did that person have a nickname? Yes, ma'am. What was that nickname? Head, H-E-A-D. Now, how was Head ever brought in as a suspect? Yes, he was. And was he interviewed? Yes, he was. Did you um, collect any information, any evidence um, from that arrest of Quintez Griffin? Yes. 
And was that evidence submitted to the GBI or the ATF? Either one. Yes, ma'am. All right. Throughout the month of January and into February, were you personally aware of other incidents that you then looked into as connected with the murder of Donovan Thomas? Um, not myself in particular, but I was getting information from the gangs unit. All right. And when you were given information from the gangs unit, what, if anything, did you do to aid in your investigation into the murder of Donovan Thomas? Um, at that time, we did a collaboration. Um, anything that they needed done, like search warrants or anything pertaining to that nature, or oral production for inmate to do an interview with, mm -hmm. I would I would conduct that for them. And when you would do things like an order of production to produce an inmate, um, is there a record that you're taking someone out of custody to APD, for instance? Yes, ma'am. All right. And did you keep um, records of, of each inmate that you did that with? Yes, ma'am. Now, when you talked about um, Spencer Wright, how did you learn about Spencer Wright? Um, the Okay. Let me phrase that better. Did Spencer Wright reach out to you, or did you reach out to Spencer Wright? Um, neither. He did. He reach out to a member of the Atlanta Police Department. Yes, he did. And when he reached out to a member of the Atlanta Police Department, did that member of the Atlanta Police Department reach out to you? Yes, they. Ever ruled. Yes, and they did. At the time that you spoke with Spencer Wright. Um, was that the name that you thought was his name? No, Spencer Wright was his real name. Right. Yes. Was that the name that you were first advised no, when he talked to you? No, Do you remember the name? I think it was um, Robinson, I believe it. Nicholas Robinson? Nicholas Robinson he used. How did you learn, or from whom did you learn, that his name was Spencer Wright? Uh, Detective Gaither of the Gaines Unit. All right. Between January of 2015 and October of 2015, uh, when you interacted with Spencer Wright, were there any other steps that you took that you can describe for the jury to help you solve the murder of Donovan Thomas without going into anything anybody said, just the steps that you took? Yes, I will work and correlate information along with the gang unit, mm -hmm. um, possibly develop suspects based on their investigation. Okay. Was the, do you know how many incidents between January of 2015 and October of 2015 um, you looked into to aid in your investigation of the murder of Donovan Thomas? Yes, ma'am. How many? It was over 40. Were all of these incidents the same type? Were they, what type of incidents were they? Uh, retali uh, retaliation shootings. Did you interview the people who were affected by the shootings? Did you have an occasion to interact with or interview any of the people who were affected? No. Did members of the Atlanta Police Department, yes, responding officers? Yes, ma'am, in the gang unit. And did was it always Detective Dennis and Detective Gaither, or did, for instance, Investigator Connor, Investigator Price, and other people help you? Sustained. Was it always Detective Dennis and Detective Gaither? Yes, ma'am. Sustained. Who in the gang unit gave you information during the course of your investigation of um, the murder of Donovan Thomas? It was Detective Gaither, Detective Dennis, and Detective Underwood at times gave me information also. Detective Underwood, does she work in any other capacity with any other agency? Uh, I believe she worked hand in hand with uh, the ATF. Was she a task force officer? I believe so, yes, ma'am. Did Detective Underwood ever um, participate in any of your interviews with persons that uh, you found were of interest in your investigation? Not that I can recall. Did Detective Dennis and Gaither? Yes, ma'am. 
were they the only persons who helped or participated in these interviews? Yes, ma'am. Do you know how many interviews you conducted in trying to find out or solve the Donovan Thomas murder? Objection to solve. Objection to what? To solve. solve. Oh, okay. Sustained. I, I asked to, to help. To help. Okay. Rephrase it. Do you know how many interviews that you conducted to aid in your investigation into the Donovan Thomas murder? Probably a little bit more over 12, a dozen, dozen or more. Were these between January and October 2015, or did you do any after that day? After that day. All right. Now, at some point, do you try to locate or determine what vehicle that is that you saw, that grayish vehicle that you saw in the surveillance? Yes, ma'am. What steps do you take to identify that vehicle? Um, it was one based on a description given by one of the victims. Um, I started sending around um, other, other to other officers or detectives mm -hmm. in the Atlanta Police Department who are very familiar with vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, and without talking about what anyone says, unless mm -hmm. I specifically ask you, mm -hmm. beyond seeking information from other people, did you take any other steps to identify that vehicle? No, ma'am. No, 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 no. Did you, at what point did you learn of a specific, did you ever learn of a specific make and model vehicle that you were interested in in that investigation of Donovan Thomas's murder? Yes, ma'am. What was the specific make and model of the vehicle you were interested in? I believe it was an Infiniti Q35. And do you know if the Infiniti Q35 preceded any other model? No, not to my knowledge. Now, when you began interest, became interested in the Infiniti Q35, did you do anything to determine who had or whose vehicle it may have been? Yes, ma'am. Are you able to tell the jury um, whether you got that information from a source, one particular source, or multiple sources? Uh, multiple sources. How many times did you talk to Kenneth Copeland? Maybe a total, maybe four, I believe. Did Kenneth Copeland provide you information that you were able to, in any way, use to get more information about the murder of Diamond Thomas? Yes, ma'am. Did he provide you information um, that you were able to um, confirm or deny was accurate? Yes, ma'am. Did you take steps to confirm or deny the accuracy of the information you were given by Kenneth Copeland? Yes, ma'am. Were you ever given phone numbers by Kenneth Copeland? I can't recall. Were you ever um, given information regarding um, vehicle rentals by Kenneth Copeland? Yes, ma'am. Before 2016, did you go or make any efforts to try and locate information about that? Vehicle? Yes, ma'am. Now, what vehicle information did you get that you tried to follow up on before 2016? Um, that it was possibly a rental. Mm -hmm. And a rental from where? The airport. And did you ever go out to the airport before 2016 to try and get information about it? I believe I did. Were you successful? No, ma'am. Now, after a certain point, do you turn... Do you, do you keep your file with you and that's the end of it, or do you turn it over to the district attorney's office at some point? Turn it over to the district attorney's office upon their request. When you turn the file over to the district attorney's office, does the investigation or do you stop working on the crime itself? No, ma'am. Do you work with any particular people to further investigate the crime? Yes, ma'am. Is there any one particular person at the district attorney's office back in 2016 that you worked with to try and 
further investigate the murder? Yes, ma'am. Uh, senior ADA Mike Sprinkle. All right. Um, do you know what his job was at the district attorney's office during that time? Yes, ma'am. Did he work primarily homicides? Uh, yes, ma'am. Did you participate in any interviews with senior ADA Mike Sprinkle back in 2016? Yes, ma'am. Based on, were you able to get information from senior ADA Mike Sprinkle that you didn't have before 2016? Yes, ma'am. Did you make any effort to follow up on that information? Um, I did, because I worked with him, he was, he was doing the follow-ups and letting me know. Okay. So I became his assistant. <laughs> During 2015 and 2016, were you familiar with social media? Yes, ma'am, somewhat. When you say somewhat, did it ever, did you ever utilize social media inquiries to help you in your investigations? No, ma'am. Did you ever uh, gain assistance from others with social media to help you assist in your investigations? Yes, ma'am. And... For the Donovan Thomas murder, do you recall who it was, if anyone, that gave you social media assistance? Um, I believe it was Detective Gaither and um, Senior ADA Mike Sprinkle. And how is it that Detective Gaither uh, assisted you with social media? Um, she would tell me about different media posts, okay. uh, what is what is being spread around on, on Instagram media posts, social media, period, about this incident. Would she um, capture any of those posts and provide them to you? Yes, ma'am. But she'll tell me that she's looking into this to verify. Okay. What about Senior ADA Sprinkle? Did he look into social media um, information to help you in your investigation? Yes, he did. Did he provide you with social media accounts and posts that aided you in your investigation? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Going back to Mr. Wright, um, did you interview him once without Senior ADA Mike Sprinkle? Yes, ma'am. Did you interview him again with Senior ADA Mike Sprinkle? Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, what about Quindaria Zachary? Did you ever conduct any interviews of Quindaria Zachary? Not getting into anything he said. Yes, ma'am. Do you know how many you conducted? Maybe about two or three. Okay. Did you take any steps to compare information you got in one interview with information you may have gotten in another interview? Yes, ma'am. Did you in any way use um, those comparisons to sort of either dispel information as untrue or corroborate information? Yes, ma'am. Did you learn from anyone in particular who may have rented the vehicle that you were looking into, the Infinity? Yes, ma'am. The calls for hearsay. Your Honor, the um, evidence has come in, and if we may approach so that I don't speak more improperly.
Thorpe, um, before you got the name Jeffrey Williams from Kenneth Copeland as being the person who rented an infinity from Hertz, did you know that Jeffrey Williams had rented an infinity from Hertz? No, ma'am. Were you present when are you aware of whether members of the district attorney's office in conjunction with the Atlanta Police Department went back out to Hertz in 2016? Yes, ma'am, I'm aware. Did you all talk to the same set of people when you went in 2015? Do you know of who you talked to was the same persons that they talked to in 2016? Um, I do not recall. I do not know that they're the same person. And were you able to get more information in 2016 once you began working with the district attorney's office? Yes, ma'am, a lot. Did you use that information gained from Hertz to aid in your investigation into the murder of Donovan Thomas? Yes, ma'am. Without saying um, what was said to you, were you able to determine during your investigation if um, people went in outside of Atlanta after the murder of Donovan Thomas? I do not know about that part. Did you get any phone records during your investigation into the murder of Donovan Thomas? Yes, I did. Did Detective Gaither aid you in getting some of those phone records? Yes, ma'am. And when you get phone records in investigations like this, would you tell the jury how it is that these records assist you in your investigation in trying to determine who murdered somebody? Yes. Um, we use the cell phone records to plot uh, their course of travel. Also, see if they was in the area where the incident took, took place uh, based on the cell tower. Um, also, we try to see, based on their call logs, who did they call before, during, and after the incident. Do you remember um, all of the phone records that you gained or gathered through this investigation from 2015 through 2016, either alone or with other members of the Atlanta Police Department or the DA's office? Yes, so, yes ma'am. Would you tell the jury without getting into the details about the phone records themselves, some of the persons whose phone numbers you sought and were able to obtain? Yes, ma'am. Now, who are some of the people whose phone numbers you got during this investigation? Um, I believe it was Kenneth Copeland, Demiki and Garlington, um, can we call the other person's uh, real name? No, Miss Montonk, I believe it was. Antonio Sledge? Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. Who else? Um, who's, who else's phone numbers do you recall uh, getting throughout this investigation? Uh, I believe that's, that's the ones that I targeted on. Were other numbers provided to you by members of the DA's office or members of the gang? Yes, ma'am. When you met with the people that you interviewed, did you show them the surveillance footage and attempt to get information about these, this footage from the people you interviewed? No, ma'am. Why not? I did not because, because I didn't want it to affect how they described the incident to me. Okay. Now, when you... How is it that you reach a point where you turn the case over to the DA's office? For you generally, at what point are you saying, okay, here, DA's office, take the case? Um, usually have a conversation with the DA's office, a meeting. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, um, that ADA or senior ADA made a determination to transfer the, whole, transfer the file to me, uh, the full investigation completed. And we take a look at it and move forward from there. And we need your assistance, we give you a call. Okay. Follow up for investigations. Uh, is your completion of the file 
um, followed up by a determination or a, an indictment or a dismissal or something like that. Yes, ma'am. And who makes that decision ultimately whether to present it or to dismiss it as it relates to people that you've turned over to the DA's office? The, the ADA's office. And does the district attorney's office always agree with the determinations that you've made in your investigation? No, ma'am. <laughs> and um, do they ever ask you after you've turned over a file to... The question was going to be, has he ever been asked to get more information after they get a file from him? I don't know how this hearsay is request, so it's not hearsay. And, if he, and does he act on that? Why don't you just ask the second question? Okay. Sustained. You, yes, Your Honor. Do you ever act on... You know, for, do you, do you ever act on requests from the DA's office for additional information even after you've turned it over, the file over to them? Yes, ma'am. And when you act on that, do you turn over to the DA's office whatever information you get that they've asked for? Yes, ma'am. In the Donovan Thomas murder, um, do you know whether the shell casings from those scenes you described were compared to see if there were any knife in matches? Yes, ma'am. Was that done at your request, the gang units, or someone else's? My request. Did the information that you gained from every person that you interviewed uh, always um, turn out as true? Yes, ma'am. Every person that you talked to told no, no. the truth. Objection has been answered. I, I'm going to overrule. I'm going to let her clarify. <laughs> Did the information you get from the people, everybody you interviewed, did it always pan out? Did you always find that it was true or did you sometimes disprove or discredit the information? Yes, ma'am. Sometimes we proved and disproved what they were saying. Okay. And if you were able to discredit or disprove information, um, did that help you in your investigation as well? Yes, ma'am. In what way? Uh, we know if, if we hit in, hit in a wall, but we found a good door to go through to further investigation, find more information. Okay. Do you all ever, does, do you particularly in your homicide investigations ever attempt to uh, listen to jail recordings uh, to get more information about your homicide? Yes, ma'am. And did the DA's office get you information about jail recordings that aided in your homicide? Yes, ma'am. Was that Senior ADA Mike Sprinkle? Yes, ma'am. Did you also work with David White? Yes, ma'am. And was that ADA Sprinkle's investigator? Yes, he was. Was Mr. White able to get you even further information um, that helped in your investigation. If I recall correctly, yes, ma'am, he did. Do you know where, um, did you ever determine where the vehicle that you were interested in from Hertz ended up? I know, ma'am, I was able to determine where, what happened to it. Do you know, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, ADA Sprinkle and Investigator White investigated that further? Put yes, ma'am. Investigator calls for here, sir. Uh, Sustained. Okay. Without saying what information, did you get any more information about where that vehicle ended up from detective, from either Investigator White or ADA Sprinkle? Yes, ma'am. 
When you got phone numbers to look into, um, were some of those numbers given to you during the interviews of the persons who, for instance, if you're interviewing me, I offer you my number. Does that happen mm -hmm. sometimes? Yes, ma'am. Did that happen sometimes in this case? Yes, ma'am. Where was Spencer Wright located when you first went to talk to him? Um, he was involved in an incident and he was transported to the homicide office. Okay. I can't recall what street he was on. Has he been, had he been arrested? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And um, was he trying to offer up information to sort of get some kind of help with his case? Not to my recollection, no, ma'am. <clears throat> When you get information, uh, do you ever get information from people who've been arrested that want sort of quid pro quo? Yes, ma'am. And what do you do? You discard that information, or do you try to follow up on it, or something different? Uh, I try to follow up on it. Uh, does that do you? Why do you follow up on information when they're offering it for in exchange for help? Um, because that's part of the investigation process, you got to figure out if they're telling the truth, mm -hmm. um, information they, they deem in is correct and can help you further your investigation. Were you able to get information about persons you did not previously find of interest after you began working with ADA Sprinkle? Yes, ma'am. Now, when you um, get to the point where you turn over a case to the district attorney's office, um, do you have to make arrests? I mean, have you at that point made arrests or taking out warrants overall in this particular case in general do you take do you turn over the case before or after you've taken out warrants um it depends on the investigation sometimes before sometimes after a whole lot of what, times more after the arrest is made and what is it that decides whether you're going to turn it over before you make, decide who to arrest versus after um depending on the investigation like i said we have a discussion a meeting with the senior ada and let them know exactly what's going on in the investigation. This one, this is what I've determined as a possible probable cause. Nine times out of 10, sometimes they see it your way, sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. And if you've made an arrest, do you have to um, go into court and testify after, um, not before trial, but before a judge to make any determination about whether or not- Objection, Your Honor, relevance. Sustained. <laughs> Were some of the people that ultimately you believe, uh, you know, I need to approach because there's a question that I don't, this is going right. to. All right, so we're going to take our lunch break now and let's be back at. One can we be back at one thirty? Can we all be back at one thirty? Is that gonna give you all enough time? Let's do that. Since we got a late start this morning.
All right, Detective, you can step out and we'll see you back at 1.30. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The question that I was going to ask um, was regarding um, some of the people that he arrested that ultimately did not um, end up on the indictment. And I'm going to follow whatever direction the court gives, but I, I think that um, Mr. Sledge um, was a person that he arrested. Um, that probable cause was not found for, and the state did not include as one of the persons, um, Mr. Sledge and I think Mr. Copeland. I think that that's going to come out. And um, that we, not only did we not proceed on that, but um, probable cause was not found for Mr. Sledge. So I don't, that was not an appropriate question. Okay. Anything else before we break for lunch? Okay. Nothing. And, and Your Honor, just to get clarity, the court does, um, the appropriateness comes with the probable cause in the preliminary hearing, not with whether or not he took out warrants for them, right? Right. Okay. Your Honor, to be exact, the, the state began to ask the question. They said, are there any defendants or whatever the, the noun was that you believed that's inappropriate? Well, that's irrelevant. And, and it, it, if they want to be precise, they need to say that you took warrants out for not you believed. Judge, um, I, I, what this witness did and why he did it is relevant. I don't think that there is, I don't think that, you know, one side can tell the other the appropriate way to ask the question. I don't think it's an inappropriate question whether you had a difference of opinion regarding who um, and you were allowed to ask that. Yes, yes. But, of course. Yeah. But his personal belief is not relevant. Okay, then. Um, did you take out um, warrants for people we didn't indict? I mean, and I was going to ask specifically about Mr. Copeland and Mr. Slayage. Okay, but you can't ask the other issues. Okay. All right. See everybody at one thirty.